A very warm good morning. It's good to see you all. And it's also good that the NG people are on the other side and worshiping as well. And so we'll see who finishes first. Of course, it's not a race, but it's good to see you all. Say hello to the one beside you and say it's good to see you this morning. Well, today it's 912. Yesterday was 911. Of course, we understand that. I watched some of the images yesterday of 911's 20th anniversary commemoration, right? 20 years since that fateful day. Each time I do remember, I am always moved. You know, this photo came out in the BBC yesterday, BBC News. It's a rusted piece of metal, if you notice very clearly. And in front of that metal piece is the flag of the United States of America. The old World Trade Center has a souvenir right there, probably somewhere in New Jersey. And against that background of this metal piece, of course, stands the one World Trade Center, the new building that we see every single time when we see New York City. But this particular news item or commentary yesterday, for me, made me really curious. It says something like this, 911 anniversary from United to Disunited States. That was yesterday, a commentary. And this commentary ends with these words. 20 years ago, Americans in the face of tragedy were united. Today, with relative peace and considerable prosperity, they are bitterly divided. 20 years on the U.S., feels a much sadder, more introspective place. The U.S. is sadder and much more introspective. You know, emblazoned on the great seal of the USA are the words, you pluribus unum. You know what that means, right? Out of the many, one. And that's the United States motto for all citizens of this great nation. Today, that motto is being challenged at its very core. One nation, or many nations, one? I doubt if we still call, really, the United States. The fault lines are cracking up in the areas of politics. Is that the reason they're there? Not, no, 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 of course not. In the areas of politics, in the areas of religion, in the areas of class, gender, and especially race. And we begin ourselves to isolate and to insulate. That is the tendency of everyone in this milieu that we find in the USA. And so the question for us this morning is this. Where is the church in all this? What does Christ expect of us? One sure biblical foundation I understand is this. The church is to build bridges and cross the ethnic divide. That's our theme for the whole quarter, crossing the ethnic divide. And in crossing that divide, there's something we'll learn about Scripture this morning. It is a hand-in-glove enterprise, and I'm going to explain what it means to be hand-in-glove. It is, on the one hand, humanly impossible to actually cross the ethnic divide. It's impossible. Don't even think we can do it. Yet, on the other hand, it is mysteriously doable. <laughs> Isn't that ironic, a paradox? It is humanly impossible, and yet it's mysteriously doable. And so what will it take to cross the bridge? What will it take for us to start friendships with others who are not like us? What will it take to do this and love them as Christ does love each and every nation. Two things in scriptures, I believe, point to the answer. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, and we'll look at the story beginning with verse 25 until verse 40. I'm not going to read the scriptures, it's a little long, but I think you're familiar with the story, and we'll go through that as I explain 
what that passage means for us today. There's two things in Scripture that point to the question, what will it take to cross that bridge, start new friendships with people who are not the same as us and love them as Christ does? Two things. Number one, we need to see the hand that fuels the work, that fuels this crossing of divides. See that hand. First of all, I start with this supernatural planning that happens. If you look at verse 26, the story begins like this. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. If you look at verse 29, and the Spirit said to Philip. Then if you go to verse 39, the end of the story, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. What's the occasion? He was somewhere in Samaria, together with all the scattered ones, the Christians who were scattered because of the persecution. And then there was an angel of the Lord who spoke to Philip and told Philip, I want you to go to the desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. And there you're going to meet this official, an Ethiopian eunuch. That's the story. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Spirit said to Philip, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away after he was encountered by the Ethiopian. And so if you look at this story, the book ends of the story. It begins with the angel of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. It ends with the Spirit of the Lord. There is a divine, supernatural force in this gospel enterprise, in this crossing the ethnic divide. There is a spiritual, powerful, supernatural force that is at work. See, angelic visitations move men to action and witness. Spirit visions activated heavy feet, hard hearts, and inclusive minds. The task, brothers and sisters, of reaching one of a different ethnicity, simple obedience will not do. Even the first disciples would not do it. It took persecution to do it. And this time, it takes an angelic spirit visit in order to get the job done, in order to cross that bridge. Nothing new today with us. It was the same back then. The work of multi-ethnic gospel sharing is a supernatural task. Therefore, we would be silly to think we can do it. Only the hand of God can do it. So it's planned supernaturally. There's a second thing here. It's also played out sovereignly. If you look at verse 27, behold. And so Philip went from Samaria to Jerusalem to this desert road, and behold, an Ethiopian eunuch. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, if you look at the story very well, the plot takes on an it just so happened kind of an encounter. You know what I'm saying? It just so happened that he was there. It just so happened that he came to Jerusalem to worship. It just so happened that he was on the way back to Ethiopia. It just so happened that he was in, in touch with a scroll of Isaiah and it just so happened he was reading Isaiah chapter 53. It just so happened when Philip got there with the Ethiopian. Now, think about that for a while. Isn't this thing coincidental? Aren't things just random? They just happen? Well, in reality, there's no such thing as suerte in Filipino or Hispanic. There's no such thing as bad luck. See, everything is designed by God. If you are a follower of Christ, all your circumstances are ordained by God. And so here, we find out about the person of the Ethiopian, his power, his purpose, and his problem. And it just so happened, Philip found him. Just so happened, he was an Ethiopian. Just so happened, he was the royal treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia. Boy, he, this guy is the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve of the country of Ethiopia. It just so happened he came to Jerusalem to worship. Now, you would think about that for a while. Why would an Ethiopian go all the way to Jerusalem to worship? He probably have heard 
has heard about Judaism. He probably has heard about the Jewish religion. He probably was fascinated by it. And so he thought, well, there's a festival over there and I'm on vacation. Why not take my holiday over in Jerusalem? And so he was in Jerusalem to worship. And now it just so happened he was reading the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, and it was on chapter 53. Now think about this for a while. You see, the Bibles during their time was not like our Bible with chapters. In fact, it was not even one book. They had a scroll. They had scrolls of different books. And so he was somehow uh, having in his hands a copy of the scroll of Isaiah. And so he had to roll the scroll to read it. And so when he rolled the scroll, guess what? It's not like our Bibles with chapter and verse. There are no chapters and verses. Can you imagine? Can you imagine our Isaiah? How many chapters? 66? Without any chapters and verses, and you just read and read and read and read. And so he happened to be in our Bibles today in chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. Think about that. He just looked at that, and verses 7 and 8 of Isaiah 53 talks about the Messiah. He talks about the coming Jewish Messiah who will free the Jewish people. And so that's where he is. Now, the question is this. Who can plan such a meeting? You see, nobody researched on the demographics of Jerusalem at a religious festival. No strategic plan was laid by the disciples in order to reach the world. In fact, many followers of Jesus fled because of the persecution initiated by Saul of Tarsus. Who can plan for such coincidences? God does. We can't. He does. That is why there is no good luck. There is no chance. There is no randomness in the Christian life. God orchestrates our circumstances for a reason. And for me, it always boils down to two reasons. Your circumstances are for the glory of God. Your circumstances are for the gospel of Jesus. Those two, all the time. The glory of God for your circumstances and the gospel of Christ in your circumstances. You know, I remember when I was still living in Singapore, I took up Mandarin. Can you believe this? At my young age, I said, I need to learn Mandarin. That was for the sake of my son who was entering primary school or elementary school and he needed to learn one of the mother tongues. That would be Chinese or Malay, Bahasa or Tamil, Indian. He said, let's learn Chinese. And for his sake, I said, I'm going to learn this as well. And so I went to the university for an extension class in Mandarin. And in that class, first day of class, there was probably a dozen of us. And all of them were overseas students. They were young students. They were university age students. And I was the only one in my, I don't remember what year. But I was the only old one in there, and there was one particular lady. Her name is Ai, Ai Huynh. She's Vietnamese. Charlotte in English. And Charlotte was there, and she was really good. I can see she can pick up, you know, the, the, the ni hao's and, you know, all these, all these Chinese phrases. She can pick up. Even the characters are easy for her to decipher. Well, one day, after the class... We were on our way home, of course. Of course, I didn't know her that well. All I knew about her is she goes to school somewhere in Singapore and she's taking Mandarin. And so when we came down the lift or the elevator and we crossed the street to the bus stop. Now, the bus stops over there are not like here where generally there's hardly a bus stop. And if there's a bus stop, there's only one bus, you know, that goes through that bus stop. Over there, you have one bus stop but you have 10, 12 different buses that go in there. And so you need to be careful what bus you ride on. And so we were at the bus stop and said, okay, maybe she's going somewhere, she's going. And so we, I saw my bus, 67, and I hopped in, and she hopped in too, the same bus. Of course, I wasn't talking to her. And after about half an hour in the bus, I pressed the buzzer in the bus to signal I'm about to alight 
to drop off. And so the bus stops, and my bus stop, I alight. She alights. Now, my home was a condominium across the street. Now, there's lots of condominiums. There's lots of apartments around. Left, right, back, front. Everything is apart. So she can go anywhere. I cross the street. She crosses the street. And I said, ah, there's something wrong here. Maybe she is on the other side or that side. But when I entered our gate, she entered the gate. She lives in the same condominium estate where I live, where we live. And guess what? I said, enough is enough. My name is Carlos. We are classmates, right? Yep, I've seen you. And we live in the same area. Yes, we do. Well, let us invite you for dinner one day. And we did. And she got to know us. And we became such good friends. And of course, in that friendship, we share to her our stories. We share to her who we are. We share to her our children. We share to her our faith. And after a while, she comes to faith in Christ. She becomes a very good friend. We still keep in touch. She now lives in Houston, Texas. Our circumstances are not random. God orders everything in your life for a reason. And so the question is, are you aware of that? And are you doing something about your circumstances? You see, the hand that moves, it plays out sovereignly in our lives. There's a third thing. It's also presented scripturally. You see, verse 32, now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this, and I say it's Isaiah 53. I don't need to read the whole quotation of Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. And so that passage he was reading was about the suffering Messiah. So there is this Messiah, the, the one who would liberate the people of Israel, the one who would be the ruler, who would be a benevolent ruler, who would give them freedom, not just physical freedom, not just economic freedom, but shalom, rest from every side, spiritual freedom, salvation. And so it's talking about the suffering Messiah. The scripture reference, of course, is pointing to one person, and that's Jesus himself. And this guy had no single clue about the reference of this passage. He was exposed to truth, was eager for the truth, but the truth still did not make sense for him. He was still actively searching for answers. You know, inevitably, all our work of friendship winning will include a sharing of the word of the gospel. We do not make friends to share the gospel. That's making use of friendship. But we actually make friends because the great commandment behooves us to love our neighbor, regardless of whether they receive Christ or not. And so we make friends regardless, but we pray that in that friendship context, they would hear it from us and would share the same faith as us. But don't make friendship a means to an end. Make friendship an end in itself because God said, love your neighbor. And in that context of friendship, reach your friend for Christ. Even if they deny Christ, maintain the friendship. That's who we are. That's what we're called to do. Last Monday, Labor Day, my mother's side of the family had an impromptu get-together for the passing away of my uncle in the Philippines. There were 16 of us who got together, some in the Philippines, some here in the U.S., some in Canada, one in Hong Kong. Five were born again, including myself and Suzette. And after my uncle back in the Philippines explained the manner of the death of my other uncle, the memories that were shared concerning our dear uncle, the method of how to dispose of his remains, the memorial became a topic of conversation among the 16 of us. And after talking about whether to conduct it the Roman Catholic way or a Protestant way or whichever way, soon, because they know I'm a pastor, they would say, hey, Kaloy, would you like to pray? 
And I said, of course I'd love to pray. And so I prayed. And of course, in praying, you share the gospel in prayer, don't you? But of course, I have a cousin in San Francisco who's a pastor at CCF in San Francisco. And so they too asked him, would you like to say anything? Because they know we're the religious ones. And so he did, and he began preaching the gospel. And then ended with a very short one-sentence prayer. That was it. You see, our, our circumstances, our, our occasions are not random. Even though we are not actively planning things, God is. And he creates those so that he receives the glory every time. And so that we might have the opportunity to relay who we are and what Christ means to us. Now, here's a question I have pondered while studying this text. Why was this particular story included here in the book of Acts? You know, Luke, Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, could have actually replaced the story with something else. I mean, he has, he's a historian. He has lots of notes. He's got lots of things to say, well, I'm not going to put that. I'm going to put this. You know what I'm saying? Writers are like this. They always think like this. What to put, what not to put. He decided to put this story in there. And I wonder why. Why not the story of Thomas who went all the way to India? Why not the story of Matthew or any of the other 12 disciples? Why Philip? He's not even one of the 12. Why Philip? Why and what is the practical significance for us who are reading it today? There is. She sees not just a story. And here's what it is. I believe it is because God wants us to know this gospel enterprise will be a success. It's been predicted. It's been promised. It's been mandated. Make disciples of all ethnicities. Make disciples of all nations. Not just one nation. All nations. Now, if you were one of the 12 disciples hearing this, or even the 50 or 500, you wonder, is he insane? You know, it, this is preposterous. And then in Acts 1.8, of course, Jesus said, now resurrected, of course, he says, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now for us who read this today, of course, that's doable, that's possible. Of course, right? Today, where there's airplanes, you know, there's technology. And back in those days, there was not even a telephone. How do you do this? This wasn't just a nice promise made by Jesus. You know, God understands how seemingly unattainable this goal was for the first disciples. In fact, Michael Green, in his book, Evangelism in the first century or the early church wrote something like this. It was 11 men whom Jesus commissioned to bring the gospel to the whole world. 11 men. They were not distinguished, not well educated, not or not having influential backers. They were nobodies. If they had stopped to weigh up the probabilities of succeeding in their mission, even granted their conviction that Jesus was alive and that his spirit went with them to equip them for their task, their hearts must surely have sunk. So heavily were the odds weighted against them. How could they possibly succeed? And yet they did. See, the reason there is this story inserted in the book of Acts is to foster faith that the gospel enterprise to all ethnicities, insanely outrageous as it sounds, will be done. See, nothing is impossible to God. What he promised, he will fulfill. And here, he gives the troubled disciples a glimpse of vision accomplishment. An Ethiopian. That is why. See, back in those days, when you say Ethiopia, 
in the Roman Empire, it was considered the remotest part of the earth. Did you know that? Click on Google, put there the Roman map, and it'll show you a, a, a picture of the Mediterranean Sea in the middle and colors that tell you how far and wide the Roman Empire was. And it'll actually show you, like, similarly, a picture of the United States. It's a similar, similar empire. But Florida, you know Florida? In the map of the United States? You know where Florida is? Right, okay, good. You see Florida, it's like the southern, easternmost section, right? It's like an add-on. Ethiopia is like that. If you look at the Roman map, it's the very end of the world, known world back then, an Ethiopian eunuch. That's why he's include, the story is included right here. And so for the first century follower of Christ, to touch an Ethiopian with the gospel was a precursor to the success of the global gospel enterprise. It will happen. Whether you participate or not, it's going to happen. It was the remotest part of the earth and the last of all nations, Ethiopia. And so no longer were the disciples' minds limited and engraved with a phrase, that's not going to happen. And some of us are probably thinking the same way with our new vision. Multiply, multi-ethnic church. Some of you are saying, that's not going to happen. Yes, it will not happen if we do it thinking we can make it happen on our own. But God will make it happen. And so see the hand that fuels the work. Here's the second thing. You sport a glove that fits the hand. And so the hand will make it happen. Who are we in this enterprise? Well, we're like the glove that fits the hand. See, what happens here is this. Philip was so skillful in his conversation. He was able. He heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch said, please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Now here's a man who is able, he has the ability, he can converse, he can communicate. He posed questions. Do you understand what you're reading? He didn't come in, in there and said, hey, you know, I know exactly what Isaiah means when he says that. He doesn't even do that at all. He simply asked questions. He posted himself beside him. He was running beside his chariot, right? He pointed him to Jesus. Three things. He posed questions. He posted himself right beside the man. And then he pointed the man to Jesus. You know something? When you ask questions of somebody, of another, you show incredible curiosity and interest in that person. So rather than speaking our minds all the time, speaking our opinions, sometimes the best way to communicate, even with our children, is to ask questions. Because asking questions show that we are interested in finding out what is going on. And so he kept up with the chariot, and then from where the person was in his quest, he presented Jesus to him. Let me say this. In this church, we don't need more knowledge. We need more skill. Not more content, more competence. Not more information, more ability. We need to be trained more. And training is not a matter of having more information. Training is more of doing. It is getting the ability to do something well. So let's not think 
that studying and studying and studying and studying the Bible alone will do it for us. We need the Spirit of God to fill us and then empower us as we get trained, as we get competent and have the ability to be used by Him. And so I encourage you, be trained. Not simply gather more information, but get trained and get ready for the work. That's how God, that's how the glove will fit the hand. Skilled in conversation. Here's the second thing. He surrendered to the call. He was available. Verse 26, let's go back. The angel said to him, Arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he arose and went. Verse 29, Go up and join this chariot, the Spirit said. And when Philip had run up, he ran up to the chariot. You know the inclusion of the desert road? You wonder, it's in parentheses. This is a desert road. You wonder, why would even, what's the importance of that? Why, why say it's a desert road? Who cares? Well, Philip will care. You know why? Nobody runs a marathon in the desert. You know what I'm saying? You want me to go meet that Ethiopian down the desert road and try to catch up on the chariot? Are you serious? And that's exactly what it is. It's hard. You probably will say no. And yet he said, yes, I'm going to do it. You know, I was in Palm Springs over the Labor Day weekend. It was 110 degrees. At night, it was 95. Evening. They said, what are we going to do over here? And we looked, the zoo was open. Of course, the zoo would be open air, right? The zoo was open at 7 a.m. And it closed at 1 p.m. I said, Let's do that, but let's get out of there by 9.30 because it's really hot. By 9 o'clock, we were like, oh, this is tough. You know, I, I, I'm beginning to feel like the giraffe, you know, and, and, but, but it was nice, but it was really, really hot. No one in their right mind would go in there at 2 p.m. Nobody. And yet here, Philip rose and went. Desert road, no matter the heat, he went. You see, the obedience of Philip is remarkable. And I think it must be standard for the follower of Christ. This kind of obedience. No questions asked. No second thoughts. No reservation. He arose and went. He kept preaching in obedience to the Spirit's voice. One early church father in the first century by the name of Irenaeus Irenaeus wrote a book called Against Heresies. And in this book, he actually said, this eunuch, this Ethiopian eunuch, became a missionary to Ethiopia. Perhaps it was to fulfill the prophecy of Psalm 68, verse 31. Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. Psalm 68, verse 31. What makes Philip different to today's normal churchgoer? It is this. His life was no longer his. He surrendered it all to his master. When he was busy, he dropped it all for Jesus. When his friends called for a party, he didn't bat an eyelid to exchange the happiness with friends with the joy of angels welcoming one sinner into the kingdom. When his wife and children complained, us first, he didn't budge. He no longer owned his life, Jesus did. And he knew Jesus would take care of his funds, his friends, and his family if he surrendered himself wholeheartedly to him. He was available. When the angel said, he did. When the spirit said, he did. No second thoughts. Surrendered to the call of Christ. You know, Christ is calling each one of us in the same way. He wants your heart. And it's not just about going to church. It's just not about going through the motions of religious ritual. He wants you 
full and whole. And he wants you to, he wants to use you in very special ways if you'll only let go and surrender it all to him. And so what lessons do we learn today? Three things before I end. Number one, we need to fine-tune to God's spirit. See, this is an enterprise we cannot do on our own strength. We cannot do on our own capacity. We cannot do because we don't know how. Only God's hand will perform this, and he alone will get the glory. But we must all be spirit-filled and spirit-led. We must learn a new dependence and be obedient no matter what to the spirit calling. When he prompts, no questions asked, simply obey. No opinions expressed, simply obey. That's what he wants. Fine-tune to his spirit. Are we fine-tuned to his spirit? Do we really know his voice? Or are we so cluttered in the many voices that somehow fight, fight for who's going to be the loudest in our minds? Listen to the one voice because that is all we need. The one voice of Jesus, our shepherd. Listen to him. Fine-tune to him. Secondly, Follow God's signs. Have you ever asked God, why am I here in America? Why am I here in Southern California? Why am I here in this job? Or why don't I have a job? Why am I here at this church? You see, If you believe in divine providence, you have a specific divine reason why you're here at this very moment. You're here by design. There are no accidents in your life. Not just because you chose to be here. Sure, you chose to be here this morning. But guess what? There's a larger story, there's a bigger plot that's happening in your life, and that is God's plot for your life. And he wants you here, not because you know why you're here, but because he wants you here right now. And so do you know why you're here? Do you know why you worship here? Do you know why you have your job? Do you know why you're there? Do you know why you're living where you are? Do you know why you're even here in the United States? I ask myself the same question. Why am I here at CICC? Because I want to know, God. I want to know for sure. Because I'm not playing games. God isn't playing games with you. He wants you to know what his plans are. And he will show it to you if you follow in your heart what those signs are. Finally, find God's other sheep. The truth is, we don't have to find them. They're right at our doorstep. All it takes is an invitation. And let me say this. I would rather listen to this because I'm going to say it over and over again while I still live. I would rather you invite your neighbors to your home than in church. Listen to me again. I would rather you invite your friends, your neighbors, your acquaintances, your good friends at work to your home, not the church. And in your home, make friends with a person Reach the person. Share who you are with the person. Love the person. And in God's sovereign plan, when the time is set, share the love of Christ through the gospel. Then maybe bring them here. But start at home. How do we multiply 
And we can cry out and shout our new vision motto, multiply. Multiply yourself. Multiply your small groups. Multiply all your groups. Multiply the church. How are we going to do that? It starts where you are. It starts in your home. The church will not multiply unless we all seek to multiply. That's how it's going to happen. Find God's other sheep. Did you know that 50 to 75,000 Afghans are now in the U.S.? That's staggering, right? And you know what? Some of us are wishing maybe stay over there in, 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 in Virginia <laughs> because that's, most of them are in, in the basis, military basis. But I'm praying, send them here. Let them be our neighbors. I pray they would become our friends. Did you know that Latinos now outnumber white Americans here in California for the first time? The majority population in California are now Latinos, no longer the white people. They're right beside you. In your neighborhood, in your places of work, in school. And so I encourage you, spend less time with one another. No matter how noble what you're doing, because there's something more urgent. Invite someone into your home. Because whether we like it or not, no matter how much we love our groups, our groups have become so exclusive. And it's just difficult to get through there with a guest. And unless you're willing, it's never going to happen unless you do something about it. So the question is this. What is the glove you're wearing? Is it a glove for catching, like in baseball? Is it a glove for gripping, like in golf? Is it a glove for protecting? You simply want to protect your nice hands, like washing the dishes. Is it a glove for cleaning? Is it a glove for cooking? Or a glove for curing? Or a glove for sharing the gospel? Because the hand is at work. I pray that your glove, whatever it is, will fit the hand that fuels the work. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, I pray that your church will rise. I pray that I would make it a point to reach my neighbor, that I will invite them to friendship, that I'd invest my time because you're my master. I'll drop off everything because I've surrendered everything to you. I pray that through my example, others might follow. I pray that you would touch even a few in this church who would do the same. I do not pray for great miracles. I only pray for great hearts that will yield wholeheartedly to you. Yes, Lord, that's my prayer. And may it happen right here in this church. We want the glory to you alone because you, to you it all belongs. And we pray that our circumstances might work towards the furtherance of the gospel. So thank you for this treasure that you've given to each one of us. Teach us to be good stewards of it. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.